Good to see you. Good to see you too. Just take a sip of water there one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank All right. Uh, budget 2025 has been presented by your substantive minister. Yeah. You as the minister, I my um, what I said this morning is that I thought it was a well thought out package. Yes, um, I, I thought it was responsible. I know I, I thought it 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 looked at um, the country as a whole. It looked at the areas that needed some serious attention, yes. uh, including crime. And there were several national security initiatives. It um, looked at education, and it looked at the issue of school repairs. Uh, he identified the fact that the manufacturing sector is continuing to contribute significantly to GDP. Yeah. Uh, there were questions that were answered that were in abeyance for a while, including the issue of the refinery in point of pair, the VAT payments for small and, and medium-sized businesses, uh, the amount of tax collected from tax property, property tax so far, and the budget was a budget to me, not absent of politics, because it's partly a political statement no, of intent it, from it, the administration. It could be. be naive, right? It couldn't be, yes. It, 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 we have to accept that any budget presented by any administration is partly fiscal and economic and partly political. It states what the government intends to do. Of course. Um, what has been the response, or what have been the responses from um, team administration so far? Yeah, I think it's, it's been very positive. Uh, I mean, if you take a look at, we've had three successive years of growth, and that is uh, counter to what we've seen in the rest of the region. Many of our Caricom brothers and sisters are right now in, in the warm embrace of the IMF. Trinidad and Tobago is the only investment-grade country in all of the Caribbean region, and that is not by accident. It's due to the management of the economy by this administration. You look at um, coming out of the COVID crisis, none of our public servants lost their jobs. Everyone was paid on time, even when our revenues have fallen to almost next to nothing. And now in this budget, we have increased the minimum wage to public servants, uh, those who fall within that category, and also uh, uh, committed ourselves to paying back pay for, for the most recent period to the very same public servants. And I mean, that is unheard of if you look out throughout the region. There have been mass layoffs in the public sector from Barbados to Jamaica. So it says something about the strength of our economy and the management of our economy, and that this government has the economy in general on the right path. Things are not perfect. Uh, we have our challenges, but we are doing the right things and heading in the right direction. One of the, the concerns in the last fiscal, which actually materialized down just past the media review, was where Minister Imber and the, the Ministry of Finance pegged the oil price and the gas price. The gas price is in this budget pegged at $3.59 per MMBTU. The oil price uh, at $77.80. I think Minister Imber would have outlined that generally for the last six months or so, the prices would have hovered between $91 and $80. So he went yeah. kind of in the middle. Uh, given what happened last fiscal, and the fact that he had to recalibrate based on unrealized projections and the budget deficit for fiscal 2024 widened a bit. Do you think this is practical? Given the, and he also identified the geopolitical issues and the commodity prices yeah. and production levels, which contributed to us not realizing the revenues we projected last fiscal in the oil sector. Yeah, so if you've been looking at what's been going on with the OPEC countries, um, you will see that Saudi Arabia had been trying desperately to set a hundred dollar barrel oil as the as the floor um internationally for oil uh, that has not happened and i think they're, they're finally conceding that that may never happen the united states has now become a net exporter of oil and gas and that has dramatically changed the geopolitical issues around the energy industry globally so we have to take those factors into consideration when you know when coming up with our estimates we don't expect our estimates to be perfect, but we want to have them in line with a reasonable expectation. And that's why we have lowered the, the price going forward in this term, because we see what is happening in the geopolitical landscape of the energy sector worldwide. And we've decided to make changes so that we are in line with that. Otherwise, we would have set an unrealistic revenue figure for our budget, and that is not beneficial to the government or anyone else. 
what about yeah. what, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, you know, um, you know, Minister Manning, the issue of I think for a lot of a lot of people, we know that the budget is a document of intent, um, of what you intend to do. And yes. a lot of the times, um, it has been an experience that sometimes some things don't materialize. And some things are repeated in the budget, but it just never came to fruition. I can yes. take you back to a couple of budgets ago where the Minister of Finance said before the end of the year, people would have digital IDs. Never happened. Um, you have the issue of doing Not away with... Wi-Fi, it didn't happen. Yeah, the issue of doing away with um, immigration cards and stuff like that, which is repeated in this budget, but yes. which about two budgets ago was yes. referenced of getting paperless, never happened. It's repeated again in this budget. Yes. And so, you know, so there is, obviously, there is a disconnect between sometimes intent and actual implementation in terms of having budgets... Um, be fulfill what the intent is. It doesn't always happen. Yes, I, I would say in I would say in some cases, yes. But uh, you have to remember that many of these um, projects are far-reaching and they are a process. Um, some of those uh, some of those initiatives would never have been completed in within one year. But you still have to allocate the funds to ensure that you stay with uh, within the process. That every year you're moving, you have enough funds to ensure that the project keeps moving forward until completion. So something like digital ID cards or whatever, that may be a three-year process, but you still have to allocate funds for it each year until it is completed. Yeah, so but he didn't, say it was a, he didn't say it was a three-year project. So he said it was, well, you yes, want to get yeah. it before Sometimes the end of the year. things don't go oh. as planned. Yeah, <laughs> okay? so, as, so that's one thing. So, so does the country have a problem with implementation in terms of, in terms of, my, my, um, a lot of issues, or you think the implementation problem is minor? In in some regards, but I, I think in what we have faced in the past uh, past five years has mainly been a revenue issue. Coming out of COVID, the world economy has been extremely volatile, especially in the energy sector. We have had lots of changes. We had the war in Ukraine. We have had China changing its its uh, its economic direction. We had the United States becoming a net exporter of oil and gas. We have Saudi Arabia um, deciding that they're not going to pump up the oil price globally anymore. Things change. Because if we say something on this day today, in the next four months, I couldn't tell you what was going to happen. So we may have said that, yes, we are going to have the revenues to do something uh, this year, but then that may not have been the case. Also, we may have run into technical challenges in implementing some of, some of these initiatives. You have to remember, we have a, an infrastructure, public service, and in some cases, legislation that were designed for a digital or techno technology age. And as we go along, we, imp we implement and we make changes. We try to evolve and, and to make things better. But uh, the, the intention is there. And you have to ensure that there's funding available to, to follow through with your, with your program. Right? While I hear you, Minister Manning, I think the level of, at the level of government, and I understand unrealized revenues and funding challenges, mm -hmm. but... I, what I don't buy is that there seems an unwillingness to acknowledge there's an implementation deficit at some level because, because I'm sure the government is aware of these exigent circumstances, sometimes external to our control, when they're making these plans for these budgets. And there is a... a, a I, I don't know that there is an acknowledgement at the level that, well, if, if, we, are, if we announce 15 projects... X amount are done, and an, and, an, and an analysis done, and why the others weren't completed. And yeah. I think that is where the issue lies with me. Let me let me use let me use property taxes as an example. The previous land and building taxes uh, structure, tax structure, had been in place since maybe for 100 years. It was it was that outdated and archaic of a system. Now, for us to attempt to implement an evolved and modern property tax structure. You've seen what that has taken. It's taken almost 15 years in terms of, of reforming the legislation, going through the legislative process, dealing with the opposition, going to court, having to, to get the public on board with this change because it could not have been done without them, making sure the data protection policy includes um, data from the various agencies so that we could properly populate the valuation rule. All of these things had to be done for something that looks simple on paper. 
which is really changing our property tax uh, structure. But it is not as simple as it looks. But I don't think it looks simple. I, I never thought it was simple. Uh, and, and that's a very good example. Simple. Okay, so you, you took 15 years, you, as you say, in, 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 and you had several challenges, including political and legislative challenges. And then when it all comes down to it, there are challenges on the ground with dealing with the mass um, people who are going to, to, to try to pay property tax, who, are, who want to be compliant. And then you get that, well, at the end of October, we will go on, you'll get half online payments. Why wasn't all of that thought of before? And, and those are the issues that I think need to be acknowledged and dealt with. We, we acknowledge it, but sometimes you aren't going to see the challenges that you face until you start working with the project. You start going through it. You realize that the legislation doesn't assist you. You realize that data protection doesn't allow you to do something that you thought you could do. You realize you have to go to Parliament and make a, a, a change. You, you've Minister of Finance in Parliament almost every week, making an adjustment to legislation so that we can proceed forward. If you look in terms of some of the billion dollar projects that have been proposed in this country for revenue generation in downstream energy sector. We have an EMA that I think has not been designed to really manage multiple billion dollar projects at the same time. And we've had constant complaints uh, from various administrations about the speed in which some of these projects can re receive a certificate of, of economic, uh, or sorry, environmental clearance. Uh, uh, but the, the, the agencies that we had weren't structured to do some of the things that we want to do in this technology age. But of course, we meet the problem. We try to, to fix it. We, but you know, you run into challenges, and we work as quickly as we can to try to work through those challenges so that we can move forward. Let's look at the um, the the rationale behind what the government allocated to the major ministries. Of course, uh, health topping the scale at seven point five seven billion. Education second, national security third. Let's focus on national security because I think. Crime, I think most people would agree that crime is probably the most critical issue facing the country as a whole. And there were several initiatives outlined, including the purchase, the intended purchase of craft uh, cruisers for the Coast, Coast Guard, etc. Uh, more police cars and drones. Yes. In the next fiscal, is there a, are there timelines, specific timelines attached to those? Um, announcements or are those things still being worked out where the population will see these these initiatives as announced and with funding provided for in the budget rolling out in the next uh, in the next couple of months because we it's not alien to us that we are in an election year yeah dealing with crime is a multi-pronged approach uh, the budgetary allocation of national security is just a part of it the easy part is purchasing national security assets we've also allotted um, a large part of the budget towards education, also to social development. We want to ensure that our young people have at least a strong educational base so that they are not uh, too tempted to enter that life of crime. Also, our, our social uh, safety net uh, is also designed to ensure that the most vulnerable amongst us also have a chance at upward mobility and to living a, a, a straight and narrow life mm -hmm. in Trinidad and Tobago. So it's a multi-pronged approach the funding to, to national security is mainly for purchasing assets for dealing with the current situation. And I would say by January 1st, which is when many of the major uh, aspects of the budget are implemented, you should see that uh, many of those assets have been purchased. While I think it's, a, it's, no, it's noble, I will tell you that have, I have it on good account that while these monies have been now allocated by the budget and certainly if all, all goes as normal will be passed, the police service in particular is having procurement issues getting um, printer ink and basic administrative things in the service. So yeah. I, I'm hoping that the systems are in place for the procurement of these major pieces of infrastructure yeah. because then we will get another challenge going down the road. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, and that's the issues that we've been having. We want to implement, the country has been calling for renewed uh, procurement legislation for how long now? A long time. But of course, with that implementation, it's not a perfect system. You're going to run into challenges, and then you're going to see us coming back to Parliament to make adjustments to the legislation, because it's one thing to have something on paper. It's another thing where you have to implement it within the real world. And then you see the challenges that that presents, and it's, an, it's a living, evolving document, as is much of our legislation. So as we run into to challenges, we have to caucus, discuss it, uh, cabinet, public consultation, and then we make changes that we believe 
will make the 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 um, legislation more applicable and workable. So I, I don't think the police service is, is going to have a challenge with some of those resources that you mentioned for much longer because we recognize the issue. We have been making adjustments to the procurement legislation as we said we would, and that is going to be taken care of. Due course. Well, be, be beyond the energy sector, which has its own particular, I uh, suppose, um, what should I call it? Its own particular nuances. Nuances that that would be articulated. I, I am sure. Um, very eloquently by Minister Young, yes. um, who has been at the forefront of a lot of what has been taking place in the Ministry of Energy. Yeah. Um, so beyond the energy sector, you have the non-energy se sector, and of course there was um, certain things announced. I think some 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 of the um, people who were talking post the budget yesterday talk uh, talked about that they wish they um, they they wanted to see some more. Well, they were saying the devil is in the details in terms of how do you grow the non-energy oil sector even more and more yes. um, to, to contribute to the GDP of the country. Um, is there any particular um, um, item in the budget yes. that you feel confident as, um, as the junior minister in the Ministry of um, Finance is going to take our GDP forward with yeah. regard to the non-energy sector? And one if the, there is, what is it? One of the major focuses of this government has always been uh, boosting the SME sector within Trinidad and Tobago. And you're seeing the results of that in terms of the growth that we have seen in the non-energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago. The one good thing about challenging times, which we have come out of due to COVID, uh, due to the crash in energy prices in 2016, is that people become more resilient and more creative. And you're seeing that within our non-energy sector numbers. Uh, the non-energy sector has shown growth every year um, outside of the COVID years since this government has been has been in charge. And that is because you've implemented numerous uh, policies. We have uh, funding with the banks. We have uh, NEDCO that we, we can support entrepreneurs through uh, the Ministry of Youth Development. There are also programs that will guide young people. The Central Bank has programs. Uh, the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And I believe many of those programs are benefiting entrepreneurs in this country. We also have the Exim Bank, which we, the government has been supporting in terms of supporting the manufacturing sector, because the manufacturing sector is the main owner of foreign exchange outside of the energy sector. So we are ensuring that persons involved in industries that generate foreign exchange are also supported by having access to that, to that, to that uh, foreign exchange that they need to stay in business. So we have implemented a host of policies to, to boost the non-energy sector and the SME sector in Trinidad and Tobago. And what you've seen in this budget is simply a continuation of those programs. Well, I have, I have of course, um, I would be passionate about the creative sector. And even though well, the creative sector is always kind of mentioned in passing, I always find in budgets. <laughs> and I know that it, it's always the, it's always mentioned in passing. And the Trade and Investment Promotion Agency, under which you have now put all of these creative agencies, I'm not so sure it's a good decision, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, because I think it just increases more bureaucracy in terms of accessing whatever system. But also the synergies between those industries. Well, that's your opinion. I'm saying that my opinion is I think it just becomes more for behemoth. We love behemoths in the Caribbean, English speaking Caribbean generally. We love them. Okay. And it's now become a behemoth with several agencies coming under it. Um, of course, we haven't yet spoken to directors of, of that agency. Um, I know we have reached out, um, um, but anyway, we haven't spoken to anybody to get a sense of where that's going. I didn't hear much about it in the budget. I, maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear much reference to it, which of course it connects to the creative sector, which goes back yes. to the part that it's always said in passing. I know from a creative sector practitioner, sometimes you there are certain grants or tax benefits and stuff that you can access. I'm not talking about film. I'm talking about theater. Um, but the, the process to access a lot of these things are tedious and invasive. And really, a lot of the creative sector just doesn't bother. We are custom being on our own. We are custom fighting for ourselves, unlike other ones that are paid attention to, whether it be bands and, 
and and calypso and 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 um suka and whatever whatever the rest of the creative sector whether it be theater and dance we fight up or other performing artists whether it be choirs and stuff you fight up yeah well, let, me, let, me, let me let me just say that the uh, the minister of finance yesterday basically gave a broad overview of what is is being done in this uh this budget <laughs> as 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 crazy as that sounds after speaking for five hours and and 10 minutes i believe you're going to hear more about the details in these sectors coming from the various ministers who will speak in the budget debate starting next week we have the, the leader of the opposition speaking on friday and from next week we're going to have the individual ministers go into more detail as to what these allocations are for and what they're going to do i do know the ministry of trade and industry has a, a, a plethora of of grant programs for various aspects of the creative industry also the ministry of Tur tourism and, and also has been doing a lot to facilitate the creative sector and to, to really tie the creative sector to tourism and international opportunities so there's a lot that is being done uh, and i would think you would hear more about that going forward as the individual ministers talk about how their budget allocations will be spent when that was on the program earlier and and well he had to um he had something important to do at seven you have to go on to me no pretend but he has something important to do at seven i don't know what he has to do you could say what <laughs> say he was going to sleep but he had something important to do at seven <laughs> and he but he did bring up the issue of housing and he said he felt that he didn't hear enough about housing the building of new housing and stuff which is yeah. always an issue and i told him i did remember that the minister talking yeah. about yes, the yeah. increase in the base housing price and stuff like that so i don't know if you could clarify what was said about housing, if there was anything said, and yeah. maybe I'll be a little clearer, because it was the, something that the, went... The away. Ministry of Housing has been doing some fantastic work, um, and, I, and, and really I want to pay special compliment to the Minister mm -hmm. of Housing and, and the Minister in the Ministry of Housing. The HVIP program, or Home um, Village Improvement Program, is really one of the success stories of this government. Uh, and the government will build a starter home for some of the most vulnerable people in Trinidad and Tobago, many of them living in squatting communities and so on, a starter home for absolutely free. It would be free of charge. It's a simple a concrete structure with plumbing and uh, with electricity. Uh, so we've been rolling out that program across Trinidad and Tobago. I can tell you for a fact that South Africa East, it has been extremely effective and has been well received. The challenge, one of the challenges that we had is that the margins were so small that many of the contractors were having a challenge with, in terms of making any sort of profit on the program. So we decided to, to build a, a better structure and to also increase some of the margin involved so that we become more attractive to contractors so that we can build more of these homes for some of the more vulnerable persons in the country. Also, the Ministry of Housing would be um, involved in, a, in a, a program of refurbishing many of the HPC communities across Trinidad and Tobago. We had huge housing stock but many of the houses were not habitable at the point in time. We want to ensure that the stock that we have right now is improved, it is refurbished, and is made available to the people of Trinidad to make a location as quickly as possible. So that is the, the, the main driver of the, of the Ministry of Housing at this point in time. And in some communities, there will be construction of new homes, but there are many houses out there that are being refurbished, and, uh, and we want to make those available as quickly as possible. One of the things you mentioned earlier is the issue of property tax, and the Minister of, of Finance mentioned, or he gave an update as at Friday, the 20th of September, 89,000 residential property owners paid property tax. I think that's a strong start. I don't know if you agree. I, I'm impressed, to be honest, and I'm grateful. Yeah. And, and, and it's ongoing uh, because this is the end of the month. That should have increased, totaling $91 million in revenue. Uh, you would have been on the show a couple of weeks ago and indicated there are 400,000 eligible properties for uh, eligible for taxation. Residential, so. in total. Residential, yeah. residential. But, but it which would be means 97,000 tax notices that would have been sent out. And right. Which means that this 89, uh, this 91 million represents under a quarter of the potential revenue from that. Would that be correct? It's it, it for all four hundred thousand. Yes, for all four hundred thousand were collected. So let's just say you collect three quarter of it. You're on the road to collecting three hundred or so million dollars. Yes. 
Would that be correct? Uh, uh, the, those general numbers, we're right? In that region. That sounds as an approximation, of course. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now, the minister also identified that property taxes collected will be distributed to local government bodies for the following. Correct. Maintenance of local roads, drains, public uh, facilities, including recreation grounds, cemeteries, etc., development programs, and the provision of local okay. services. It's been collected, an announcement made on 91 million in revenue. Of course, this should be in concentrated in particular areas, depending on who paid and how the continued assessments go rolling out over the next couple of months. Is there, what can the public expect in terms of starting to receive services? Because these 89,000 people who pay now want services. Yes. <laughs> you understand? And they, and they are not going to be kind yes. and say, well, the regional corporation messing up yeah. or they don't have backhoe well, uh, or you know, they don't have this because trying, they have been compliant and yeah. done what the law requires them to do yes. people are trying to be good. we aren't exactly known for our patients but in this situation you have to understand that the collection of the property taxes will be just the beginning of the overall process of course next comes the 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 uh, reform of local government and how those services are prov provided um as i said it has to be something to be done in tandem we have to have the funding first available before we can implement some of the reforms so uh, as we start to collect the property taxes and we are certain that that is being done uh, and um, those revenues are received and available we, we will come back to parliament um, to, to implement elements of the local government reform legislation to ensure that those funds are now accessible to the various regional local government bodies so that they can do the work that they're promised to do $5 billion also deficit. The minister identified the government doesn't see the value in keeping the Clico assets. Are the Republic Bank shares included in that? No, this is Clico. This is the insurance company. The Republic Bank would have been under CF Financial. Okay. And those assets are tied to the NIF uh, fund. So the, this is Clico is the insurance company. It's, mm -hmm. It does part so of CF Financial. Only the Clico part. Uh, and also the the issue of well there's speculation i'm using it with speculation that the, the prime minister confirmed that as, an assessment has been done on tstt he said there's no consideration right now is that being considered also as something the government is looking to divest that's something the prime minister would have to speak with the national community i have not heard anything about any divestment of uh, tstt or any other state enterprise other than the ones that were announced in yesterday's budget. Um, Clico is definitely something that the, Prime, the Minister of Finance has mentioned will be divested, and that is to recover some of the, the billions of dollars that were um, given to CF, that's not given, but used towards the bailout of CF Financial to ensure that it did not present a systemic risk to the people of this country and to people of the Caribbean region. You have to remember CF Financial was one of the largest economic players in all of CARICOM. They were the largest land owners in all of CARICOM. And if they were allowed to collapse, it would have presented a, a severe economic issue for all of CARICOM. It, it would have meant mass layoffs across the region and also other challenges. So the government stepped in, bailed out uh, CF Financial, and is now trying to recover the funds used uh, to protect the people of this country and the CARICOM region. Well, the, the, the Minister of Finance talked about financing the five billion plus deficit um, in this budget, and, and he talked particularly about selling all those assets. And he talked about, for example, Magdalena, um, but he didn't really go beyond a couple references. So there has to, because those references he made, um, I am assuming there has to be more assets that are going to be disposed of in the state network that will. Why? Why, why would you assume that? Yeah. But uh, the, oh, the, the $5 billion, $5 billion dollar deficit yeah. is not going to be made entirely through divestment. A lot of it is going to be debt financing. You know, this is a deficit budget, and usually how deficits are made up for is through debt, through borrowing money. So whatever is not made up through the divestment, is the rest is going to be made up through um, through debt, through borrowing. So, so borrowing is going to be part of that $5 billion financing. As, as it has always been in any deficit budget, and we've been running deficit budgets in Trinidad and Tobago since since 2009, I believe, since the financial global financial crisis, we have been doing so. Uh, we have a plan and a goal to get to a point where we no longer are running deficit budgets. But that is something that has to be done over time, or it could create severe uh, issues. So how far, how far in our debt service ratio is the government willing to go? 
Um, we still have one of the best debt-to-GDP ratios within all of CARICOM. Some of the most indebted countries in the Western Hemisphere are in the CARICOM region. Trinidad and Tobago is still well within the international markers for debt-to-GDP ratio, and we feel quite comfortable with where we are as an economy. And also the various international rating agencies also feel comfortable with where we are as an economy, and that's why we are the only investment-grade country in all of CARICOM, and, and one of the few in Latin America and the Caribbean in general. So we are well within the global benchmarks, and we feel that we're in a comfortable position to also maintain our quality of life, but also to increase the growth that we've seen in the previous uh, three years within this. Do you think, you think the, we have enough latitude to, to, with regard to that debt to GDP ratio? It's, it's not what I think, it's, it's what the international agencies are. No, I'm asking your opinion because you're on junior minister in the Ministry of Finance. Yeah, and my opinion, You must have a sense of government's policy. My in the opinion direction is going. based on the international benchmarks, which say that we are in a good position in terms of debt to GDP ratio, where we can maintain our quality of life and also boost economic growth of Trinidad and Tobago. You know, if I had Buffy, so you'd have come at me. No, I, I said, I, I, you, you know, take it, you know, take more on Ridge if, if I didn't no, go no, for no, the car, I think Buffy didn't just snap. My point is that it's facts over feelings, it doesn't, it's irrelevant what I feel about it. I am being facetious, Brian Manning, <laughs> Minister fact Manning. That says that we are doing well. Okay. Um, one of the, the issues also that this administration has been working to me assiduously toward is the issue of leakages of revenue. Property tax is one part. The Revenue Authority has not been given the absolute green light to me, given the Privy Council ruling that it's yeah. not unconstitutional. Um, Another issue that's being delayed by, by you know... Right. Well, okay. Frivolous, we, frivolous lawsuits, yes. Right. So we're over that hill now, right? Yes. Um, how much do you think that aspect of it will now add to um, closing the, the deficit one? And how soon, given how to me strong the start of the residential property tax regime has been yes. can the population expect now to move to commercial and industrial revenue tax collection so you're asking about the the ttra or no, the ttra in the context of of, of collecting not only yes. residential tax residential property tax sorry yes. but also commercial and industrial property yes. taxes well the, the ttra is really developed to, to democratize the tax collection system and modernize tax collection in Trinidad and Tobago. And that's one of the things I've been, I've been talking to you about. We would have tr tr been trying to implement the TTRA as far back as I remember, 2005, uh, because of all of the legal loopholes and, and, and wrangling and lawsuits. Here we are today. But what it is going to do is ensure that some of the large players in Trinidad and Tobago that have been dodging taxes for an extended period of time are now brought to heel and made to pay their fair share. It is not a, a, a organization that's going to be designed to really go after some of the smaller players in, in, the, uh, in the economy, but some of the larger players. And you've seen it in the media in the past few months where there are several large players that have not been paying uh, their, their just due in taxes for quite some time. The TTRA is going to ensure that that does not go unpenalized. And it should also democratize and make more efficient. The One of those outstanding taxpayers, taxpayers um is more than what you're collecting in property tax so far <laughs> one yeah exactly you know that? one exactly. of those is yeah. more than the how much the eight the eight the the 80 how much ever thousand that Correct. pay residential property tax Correct. one that's of those about, commercial about 80, people. Thousand people right Eighty thousand people imagine that so and that's what we're trying to eliminate these some of these guys have been you know you, you put an extra burden on the people that are compliant and, but if you democratize the system and ensure everyone pays their fair share, over time you can reduce the tax burden per, per person and, and lower tax rates for the general public. But you have to ensure that everyone is paying their fair share to be able to do that. And that so is that's my question. When is that going to start, the commercial, the, 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 the commercial regime and yeah. industrial? I couldn't give you an exact timing. As I said, you never know what happens in terms of the lawsuits and and you know, consultation and other legislation that may also come to bear on this issue. So I, I don't have an estimate. I haven't heard one. If you and get I, if you get five like that one, that one that one we're talking <laughs> about. If we get five like that, yes. you get a billion dollars in tax between residential and commercial. And you can alone. be sure that there are more more 
guys out there that have not been paying their taxes. And those are the... If they get five of them, five like that one. Correct. And, and, and we, that can be used for local government services to ensure that the person, that potholes are filled, people's drains are repaired, retaining walls, garbage collection, all of these issues that we have. And we want to be ensure that local government bodies are properly funded and are able to account for the funding that they receive. What, what can we expect for this $1.41 billion that is being allocated to transport? I noticed they separated infrastructure and transport this year. Is there a reason for that? What can we call PTSC to me is an abysmal failure. That's my opinion. Abysmal. Mm -hmm. there, there, another element that is uh, going to require reform, in my view. We, we, we separated the two because much of our public transportation system is, is subsidized. It, right? Or the air bridge is subsidized. PTSC is subsidized. The uh, the, the uh, sea bridge is is subsidized. So those are, are under special consideration. Now, in terms of those, we are looking for more efficiency, and that's why it's, it's basically separated there. So we are working to make these agencies more efficient, so that we can reduce the subsidy without affecting the quality. Uh, of but that that public transportation issue, particularly with PTSC, let's separate Cal and the sea bridge is closely tied to levels of productivity and, and waste as well. So would you agree with that? Uh, agreed, yes. So a special emphasis is going to be placed on reforming PTSC then? Uh, all of those agencies, all of the transportation agencies. And as, as you see, we have an issue with, with traffic in, in Trinidad and Tobago. So we have to you know, give people reasons to, to not use cars or leave their cars at home and, and to use the public transportation system. But that comes with a certain level of efficiency. And we have to ensure that we manage cost in, in doing that. So it, it is being worked on. It's something that does take quite a bit of, of doing, but it's something that we are we have seen as an issue here, and we are going to focus on, on working on it and improving it. How um I just want I just want to ask a question. Okay. It's related to something that somebody in one of one of the comments coming out of the stream of people watching the um interview. Um with regard to film TT, which is now part of that behemoth, as I said. Um they, they were talking about the issue of cameras and stuff for the film sector because of the film sector is pretty vibrant. You have a lot of creatives um, um, in that sector trying to do work and the issue of duty-free and VAT-free access to all of the types of cameras that you can bring into the country. Yeah. Um, I don't think at this point they are VAT-free or tax-free in terms of entering. I don't know if you can weigh in on that, whether they in fact are or are not and whether there is any consideration to give more concessions in terms of getting our film, film sector, you know, moving even more forward than it already is. Yeah, I don't have details on that, but I'm sure the Minister of Trade and Industry, is, that's something that she would discuss during her contribution in the parliamentary debate. I do know that yesterday, I think there was tax-free, ex, uh, sorry, tax exemption on all sporting equipment. That was done. Uh, electric cars also is also uh, uh, exempt from taxation. Yeah, accessories on electric cars. Yes. So, so we have been working gradually to bring certain categories uh, that we think are beneficial to Trinidad and Tobago under that that tax exemption uh, safety net. So, uh, I I wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, that imported items for film would also eventually come under that that category. So, but that's something that the Minister in Trade and Industry would have to... Minister, Minister Manning, uh, is the government concerned about capital flight, and do you have a sense of how much capital flight is taking place? I don't have an exact number on me, but of course capital flight is something that we'd always be concerned with. It's part of, of managing the general economy, and uh, we, uh, you know, we attempt to manage our balance of payments and also the, the exchange rate. All of that would, would factor into with capital flight. So it is something we are concerned about. We try to manage the situation as much as possible, and that requires accountability by many of the players within our economy. And it, that's something that we are concerned about. That's something that we look at, uh, along with the central bank, on, on every single day, I would say. So, is, is there a quantification of it? Because the information I have is that because of some levels of uncertainty, and also the, the crime situation that a lot of, there are many business people who uh, access US Forex and palm it off into foreign accounts for safety yeah. nets. That would be difficult in our system. What, what I think has been happening is that persons have been generating 
uh, US dollar revenues internationally and then keeping those funds abroad. It's far more difficult to, uh, to take funds out of the system and, and export it abroad with the current banking system. So that is something that we have been looking at. Uh, I know exactly with the Exim Bank, if you access foreign exchange as a manufacturer and other business person qualifies, that you have to bring those funds back on shore in Trinidad and Tobago. So it becomes part of this economy. But uh, it, it is something that we're looking at. It is a challenge in terms of keeping a, a balance in this economy so that we can manage the exchange rate and other factors. So it is something that we're concerned with and we pay attention to regularly. But it's not about 8 a.m., so this is where we're going to have to end it. Yeah, um, but before, yeah. You, before you go, Minister, I, I, I just want to bring this issue up. And it is the issue, I'm bringing up PTSC because you're not going to drive the bus. So you're going to give a directive. No, no one has asked me. <laughs> yeah, no. It's a good thing you don't drive a bus. No, but isn't it a directive to get this system up and running properly? And two, the state of CityGate, does that ever come up in conversations? Um, all of it. But of course, you know, as I tell you, we have had revenue challenges for the past few years. So we have to be very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We have to be very thoughtful in exactly how it is we spend our funds. Yes, there are lots of things. Yeah, that but Minister, we would like to do. Oh, hold Minister. On, let, me let me finish. There are lots of things that we would like to do um, across Trinidad and Tobago, but it comes down to, do we have the funding to focus on that just yet? And if we don't, what do we have to cut to ensure that this other project gets funded. So it is a, a, it is a balancing act, and it's one that, that we have been working on and really managing effectively over the past few years. Yeah, yeah but, City Gate, City, but more people pass through, more citizens of this country yes. pass through CityGate than even the airport. Yes. And, yes. and this is about us. Yes, and it's a major part of our transportation system. It's a major part of our transportation and, and system, no and it's about us. Yeah, there's no so, reform of the overall system without... without Taking care of City Gate. I, I told yeah, you. And it should be spectacular because yeah. it's for us. Agreed. Understand. Not, not only that, Minister, school children ride the ride, school children and senior citizens ride the bus for free. A lot of households, especially for school children, when they watch their pennies, how they spend it on a on a daily, daily, the bus is crucial to them saving some money. So I think this that PTSE system, give the directive. If they cannot fulfill that, find somebody that will fulfill it for the citizenry of this country. East, Understood. west, north, south. Understood. Mr. Mali, thanks for being with us this morning. We appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks you for, for having me. Um, yeah, thanks I a lot. Tobago. I hope Tell Mrs. Have... Manning hello for us. I will. I hope you take the time to go through the budget and, you know, take a look at what's going on and then, you know, see what is being done there to benefit the people of this country. Really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you.